Whenever you think about mobile phones, the company that hits you first is most likely Apple. The California-based tech giant has managed to become the top smartphone maker in the world, and the gap between it and some of its biggest competitors, Samsung, Huawei, and the likes, seems to keep expanding almost by the day. The funny thing here is that it's not like these competitors make terrible products. In fact, when you compare them pound for pound, many of Apple's competitors actually make products that are comparatively better, and which could even be cheaper too. Still, Apple dominates the smartphone market like none other, and with each product they launch, the company only improves its standing in the market. Over the years, Apple has mastered the craft of making its products both functional tools and status symbols. And in more ways than one, this has factored into what really makes the iPhone special. In this video, we'll be looking at Apple's journey into the smartphone market and how the company grew to become the market behemoth. Apple launched the iPhone back in 2007 in an event that's now become so iconic for the way Steve Jobs helmed it. At the time, pretty much everyone was skeptical about the prospects of the mobile device being successful if not for any reason, because the iPhone was entering into a mobile phone market that was incredibly saturated. Still, if there is one thing Apple has shown, it's that you really can never bet against them. 17 years after the first iPhone was launched, Apple has released over 40 models of the device, making the iPhone one of the best-selling products of all time. Today, research shows that the company has over 1.5 billion active iPhone users and controls 53% of the market share in the United States alone. In the international market, Apple is even bigger. As of 2022, over 2.2 billion iPhones have been sold worldwide. In this year, it's pretty sure that the company will be looking to raise that number even more. When you see the story of how Apple rose to become what it is today, you kinda understand why things are so. And to understand the Apple iPhone's success story, we probably need to go back to before the devices were even launched in the market in the first place. Before the iPhone, Apple was pretty much a middling tech company. Founded in 1975 by Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, the California-based company had been through several near-death experiences. Sure, it made a huge splash with products like the Macintosh and iMac computers, but the success it achieved wasn't necessarily huge as the tech landscape moved pretty quickly, and it started to seem like Apple couldn't keep up. To make matters worse, Apple apparently had financial issues. Jobs was ousted from his role as CEO following a power struggle with another executive. But in 1997, he returned to the company he founded and began an aggressive cutting campaign in order to be lean and green. One of the very first things Jobs cut in his second stint as Apple's CEO was Newton, a digital assistant that was built to kind of work like a PDA. Announced in 1992, the Newton message pad was launched a year later, and while it got a lot of fanfare as a product when it was launched, it ultimately flopped pretty hard. Widely mocked in popular culture at the time, the Newton became a poster child for expensive but useless high-tech gadgets, and even though the device improved dramatically over time, it failed to gain market share, and Jobs immediately axed it when he came back to the helm at Apple in 1997. The experience with the Newton message pad was pretty scarring for Apple. In fact, until the company launched the iPod in 2001, the company apparently didn't want anything to do with mobile devices. The company pretty much functioned as a Mac producer, and even when Jobs returned in 1997, one of his first efforts was to try to revamp and revive the Mac to make it appeal to a broader audience. Jobs' efforts were pretty successful. He managed to turn things around by releasing the iMacs, and Apple also had some success with the Airport, a line of network cards and wireless routers that operated as precursors to Wi-Fi routers, in a way. At this time, Apple's business did about $6 billion per year in revenues. The launch of the iMac helped the company grow its bottom line by about 33%, but by 2001, the business had slowed down again and was in desperate need of a jolt. That jolt came in the form of the iPod. The portable digital music player served as Apple's first foray into mobile and consumer electronics. But while it was pretty successful, it was a bit of a niche product. 
The iPod ended up being responsible for much of Apple's revenue growth from 2001 until 2008, but the product itself didn't necessarily see the type of mass appeal that Apple would have hoped for, especially if it was to move from being a mid-tier tech company to becoming a major player in the industry. Now, before we talk about Apple's breakthrough with the launch of the first iPhone, it might be worth understanding where the market for mobile phones itself was. You see, Apple had been moving carefully in the mobile market, but they also understood that if they were to make any major splashes, they would need to be incredibly calculating in how they operate it. Before the iPhone, much of the mobile phone market had actually been a bit away from Silicon Valley. Big phone companies like Nokia, BlackBerry, and more weren't necessarily making their products in the United States. And this meant that while they were wildly successful, they also spent a lot of money on parts and components. Interestingly, the best-selling mobile phone of this period was the Nokia 3310, a device that looked quite distinct and which was especially notable for being durable. By 2005, the Finnish company Nokia had already sold a billion 3310s alone, marking a major milestone in the mobile phone market that was seen as the gold standard across the board. Apple believed that they were up to the challenge, and by January 2007, the company shocked the world by announcing that it was ready to reinvent the mobile phone market entirely. When Apple launched the iPhone, the company essentially marketed it as three devices in one, an iPod, a mobile phone, and an internet communicator. Actually, the audience had believed that Apple would pretty much work each of these devices at the same time. But Steve Jobs, ever the showman, suddenly stopped them when he announced that the company was launching all three products in the same device. iPod, a phone and an internet communicator, an iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Just like that, the mission to completely reinvent the phone and change what we know about mobile communication was born. The iPhone was set to change the mobile phone landscape entirely, and the world watched. In an interview with CNBC on the day the iPhone launched, Jobs explained that Apple's goal with the iPhone was really just to hit 1% of the global smartphone market share. To do this, the company partnered with AT&T as its official carrier, leveraging AT&T's network to expand its sales and optimize revenues as much as possible. In 2008, Apple sold the first iPhone for a staggering price of $499. Now, while the official launch of the iPhone was met with a lot of fanfare, there was also some considerable skepticism at the same time. The first gripe from most industry experts was the fact that Apple was stepping into the mobile phone market, a landscape that was incredibly saturated, and one that had so many players already struggling. We already knew the big boys, Nokia, Samsung, Ericsson, and the likes. Then there was the BlackBerry phenomenon. The devices, which were developed by research and motion, had already become a hot commodity in the smartphone market. With their intuitive keyboards and the famous BlackBerry Messenger, it seemed like no one could knock BlackBerry off its perch. At the same time, there was the rising Android movement. Google had developed this incredibly intuitive user interface for mobile phones and tablets that was killing it, and the company had licensed its software to several mobile phone manufacturers, meaning that it wasn't necessarily limiting itself to just its ability to sell phones on its own. Instead, these mobile phone makers could just manufacture their devices, and Google would pocket a small percentage of every phone being sold. On the flip side, Apple seemed to back itself into a corner here. For one, the iPhones seemed to be really closed ecosystem products. Unlike Android phones or even Blackberries, sending files from one device to another was incredibly challenging 
and even if you could, it seemed like a lot of the services that could be used on iPhones had to either be built by Apple or custom vetted by the company. For instance, it was possible to download files from the internet with iPhones. Also, you couldn't get things like music and other media components too. If you weren't buying those from Apple's iTunes store, you were pretty much left on your own. Then there was the price issue. Like we said, when Apple sold the first iPhone, the company did so at a hefty price tag of $499. Comparatively, a lot of the device's competitors were much cheaper. And Apple also had the poor luck of launching the iPhone in 2008, the height of the financial crisis, when it seemed like people didn't necessarily have so much money to spend and could barely make ends meet. If everyday Americans couldn't afford their basic necessities, why on earth would they want to splurge up to $500 on a mobile phone? When you consider the fact that a lot of these devices had some of the advantages that we just mentioned, you can kind of see why a lot of people would be skeptical about the iPhone's chances of success. Steve Ballmer, who was then the chief executive of Microsoft, ripped into the iPhone and criticized the device for not having a keyboard. As Ballmer believed at the time, the fact that the iPhone had gone for an all-touch profile, uh, you know, except for the main home buttons and things like the lock and volume toggles, meant that the device would never really appeal to business-based customers. At the same time, mobile phone developers like BlackBerry were also pretty unenthused about the prospects of the iPhone. As they believed, they had the better product, and that was that. The initial hype surrounding the iPhone was no more than a flash in the pan, and when it was all said and done, the device would pretty much die and leave the market with no more than a whimper. Interestingly, it seemed like Jobs and Apple were also aware of the many challenges that faced the iPhone from its launch. In the CNBC interview, Jobs explained that Apple's goal with the iPhone was just to capture 1% of the global smartphone market. That was the benchmark for the company, and it was really what they were looking forward to as a hallmark for success. But besides the fact that Apple probably wasn't setting any overly lofty goals, Jobs also explained something that seemed striking at the time. First of all, you look at handsets. This is probably not only the most vibrant technology sector there is out in the globe, this is also one of the most competitive. Why in the world would Apple Computer want to jump into the handset market with so much competition and already so many players? You know, uh, one of the, the, the biggest uh, motivations for, for working so hard for a few years to make a great product is you want one yourself. And uh, we use all the handsets out there. And uh, boy, is it frustrating. It's really frustrating. It's a category that, that needs to be reinvented, needs to be made more, not only more powerful, but much easier to use. That right there was the magic of Apple. And it was something that had guided the company all these years. If you think about it, Apple never really makes anything. Even to date, many of the company's flagship products are things that have been done before. The company wasn't the first to make the mobile phones, and they sure weren't the first to make laptops. Tablets, smartwatches, wireless earphones, and so many more had been developed long before Apple hopped on the scene. Instead of being the ones to make the first devices in their class, however, Apple focuses on something else, making their products better. Essentially, the company waits for others to develop something, then they work on making that thing better and packing a bunch of features into it. At the end of the day, Apple's success story shows that many times, it's not really about who becomes the first mover. It's more about who gets to build the better product. You might end up with something that's groundbreaking, but if someone else comes onto the scene with a product that works better, there's a significant chance that they'll take the market away from you. Apple decided to focus on ease of use. They found existing flaws in several of the best-selling phones in the world at the time, and they simply said, we'll make something that works better and everyone can find easier to use. Boom, the iPhone was born. So we pretty much had two opposing sides when it came to the prospects of the iPhone and how the device could perform at the end of the day. Now, how did it actually do when it was launched? 
Well, to put it simply, the iPhone didn't do so great. In 2007, the first year of its release, the iPhone sold about 1.4 million units in total, with about 80% of those coming in the fourth quarter of the year alone. To put that in perspective, Nokia sold 7.4 million mobile phones in the fourth quarter of 2007 alone, and several other major phone manufacturers reported higher phone sales than the newcomer iPhone. Nokia especially seemed like the behemoth that no one could beat. The company had already built a solid base in the late 90s, and when the 2000s came, it just kept on building on that. By the time the late 2000s were around, Nokia was the market leader, a dominating force that no one could topple, no matter how much they tried. And even Apple, with all the fanfare that they had managed to build with the initial announcement of the iPhone, just didn't seem like they could keep up. Now, you might be wondering what really caused these initial lackluster sales. Well, to be fair, there were several things, but one of the most notable reasons was the fact that for the first year, iPhone users couldn't actually download any apps. This meant that users were limited to what came with the phone itself and nothing else. In 2008, though, this changed. Apple launched the App Store for iPhones, creating its very own native store for mobile apps. With the App Store, users could now be open to a world of applications that would make their lives much easier. At the same time, app developers could test their skills and ship products directly, meaning that they didn't have to wait so long to get people to use what they built. Anyone could simply push an app, send it to the App Store, and once Apple approved it, their app would be open to the millions of iPhone users worldwide. The launch of the App Store marked a turning point for Apple and the iPhone. Thanks to it, iPhones became more functional, and this was enough to sell even more people. It also helped that several other mobile phone manufacturers and operating system developers seemed to have been caught off guard. Blackberries were also closed ecosystems, and it was impossible to download apps on them at this time. As for the Symbian operating system, it didn't really have a native store. Instead, people could simply download apps from the internet, and as we all know, this was a huge security risk at the time. Interestingly, even Google hadn't caught up at this point. The company launched its Google Play Store in 2012, meaning that everything, from Google Play Music to the Google Play Store, didn't even come until a full four years after Apple had launched its own marketplace. Apple struck gold with the App Store, and that was the jet fuel that caused the rocket ship to soar to the moon. As of 2011, with Apple's flagship product being the iPhone 4S, the company reached a milestone shipping 50 million devices in a year for the first time ever. Dominance in China So far, we've spoken about Apple's exploits, especially in the United States. But what about the world's other top smartphone market? Yep, we're talking about China. If you know anything about China, you'd know that any foreign business looking to succeed here will need to really bring their A-game. It's especially true about tech. Instead of adopting American tech companies and products, the Chinese pretty much just work up their own versions instead, and all their citizens adopt those. Uber, Amazon, Facebook, you name it, all of these tech giants have pretty much failed in China, with their local-based counterparts dominating the market instead. But not Apple. In early 2024, it was announced that Apple had become the number one mobile phone vendor in China for the very first time ever. The company beat out several top local vendors, including Honor, Oppo, Xiaomi, and Vivo, achieving an impressive 17.3% market share. And even though shipments actually dropped by 2.22%, Apple's sales in China have remained historically strong. Apple's success in China has been due to several things. First is the company's increasingly cozy relationship with the Chinese government. Now, as we said earlier, China's government generally doesn't play well with foreign tech companies. And hey, even local tech companies can get the boot if they step out of line. Remember Alibaba? For Apple, though, it seems like there's an exception somewhere. In fact, China's government isn't just friendly with Apple, it almost literally goes out of its way to be cozy with the company. 
The government helped with subsidies that allowed Apple and Foxconn to essentially build an entire city in China where they manufacture phones. In return, Apple has been pretty cozy with the government, sharing data and pretty much looking away from the many moral allegations being levied against the state. Basically, it's been a symbiotic relationship between Apple and the Chinese government. Everyone gets something, and it doesn't really seem like there is any friction between both parties. Another major factor is the fact that consumer preferences actually favor Apple a lot in China. The country is home to millions of people, and thanks to the economic turnaround that China has witnessed in the past two decades or so, many of these people actually have considerable levels of disposable income and can easily splurge money on the latest flagship devices. So it isn't necessarily out of line to see everyday citizens using the latest iPhone. And when you throw in the fact that these devices are also pretty functional, you can see why iPhones generally do pretty well in China. At the same time, we should also consider the fact that China has historically been a mobile-first market. The PC never really got established in the country, and most people prefer to do their basic computing on their mobile devices. As such, people are way more willing to spend on their phones, and iPhones have the dual benefit of being both functional devices and statement pieces. With a perfect blend of favorable government policies and a market that's more willing to make use of them, it's no wonder that iPhones have dominated China's smartphone landscape significantly. One common trend in the tech space is the fact that being the market leader isn't enough. Most companies don't just stop at dominating their niche, they go even further. And for Apple, that meant driving the conversation of innovation even more forward. Now that they had the dominant iPhone, Apple went on to innovate around it even more to become more profitable. With the release of the iPhone 7 in 2014, the company did away with the standard headphone jack, releasing AirPods instead, as a separate standalone product that users would need to purchase. And by 2020, Apple made more money from selling AirPods alone than companies like Twitter, Snapchat, Shopify, Spotify, and more made altogether. The drive towards innovation has also led to the development of products like the Siri Voice Assistant, Apple's impressive tracking feature, and so much more. And as these phones have become even more functional, the demand for them has really only grown significantly too. Apple's dominance of the smartphone market is a pretty interesting phenomenon. The company today is the world's most valuable public company, and much of that growth was because of just how revolutionary the iPhone has been. And as the world waits to see what could be next, you can count on Apple to blow our minds once more.